All right, everybody. Welcome to our session today. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Caridwin Foley, and I'll be, I'll be moderating today's session. Um, I work at the Massachusetts Office of Technical Assistance, which uh, some of you might know. We um, provide Massachusetts businesses with free confidential toxics use reduction technical assistance. And I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for this session. Uh, so first off, I'd like to welcome Dr. C. Mark Smith, uh, who is the Director of the Office of Research and Standards and the Wall Experiment Station Environmental Science Program at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, he's currently leading MassDEP's work uh, assessing risks and establishing state policy on uh, emerging contaminants, including PFAS. And he also oversees MassDEP's uh, risk assessment guidance and policies for hazardous waste sites, for drinking water, air pollution, and solid waste. And uh, he also does a lot of work on analytical approaches to assessing environmental contamination. Um, he's published on a wide variety of topics and was uh, instrumental in the development of and implementation of uh, policies to reduce mercury uh, pollution. Um, so, Dr. Smith, uh, please uh, take it away. All right, I'm relieved to actually have a presentation like right at the get go because earlier session today, it wasn't there, which created a bit of consternation. So anyway, um, I'm gonna spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so just providing an overview of a study we've been working on, uh, looking at uh, various pesticide mixtures in Massachusetts and trying to characterize in some cases, what is certainly some PFAS contaminants in one, in one case, what seems to be possibly something else. So I wanna uh, just acknowledge a bunch of people who have been involved in this work. Um, so uh, it, Mass DEP, um, myself, Oscar Panko, <coughs> Pancorbo, um, Lisa Jordan are two of my laboratory specialists uh, up, up at uh, the Wall Experiment Station. Kathy Kiley, who's been handling all of the uh, um, the finances and the contracting issues uh, excellently. And then some colleagues at the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, Taryn Lascola and uh, Honja Winje. Um, and TRC, Elizabeth Denley and Yulia Kal Kalmakova have been doing the sample collection and coordinating, um, uh, getting the samples from our mosquito control district sampling the pesticides. And a couple of folks at Alpha Analytical and then a shout out to, to Peer, that's the public employees for uh, environmental responsibility, Kyla Bennett, really first focused attention on this issue, on this issue uh, a little over a year ago. And we've also been working, I think, quite uh, successfully with some of the manufacturers of the pesticide formulations to try to um, either uh, determine where the PFAS was coming from and to get it out. So a little bit of background in Massachusetts, um, you know, mosquitoes that are used to control, uh, pesticides that are used to control mosquitoes, not the other way around, um, are registered by a, a particular board, uh, it's the Mass Pesticide Board, um, and they uh, issue approvals for use of these pesticides following a review mostly of US EPA uh, information. Um, and the uh, Department of Agricultural Resources is primarily responsible for that. Um, so we do on occasion um, conduct aerial spraying events um, in certain areas where mosquito-borne diseases in particular, um, Eastern equine encephalitis, which is a potentially lethal um, uh, viral disease carried by certain types of mosquitoes. And we do get outbreaks, you know, they seem to run every 10 years or so um, where the, the uh, population density of the mosquitoes that are infected are high enough that our Department of Public Health declares a public health threat. Um, and then we start the process of uh, doing some aerial spraying to tamp down those populations. Um, my agency has been sampling following those spraying events, surface waters in the areas where they're spraying to make sure there aren't any adverse impacts to drinking waters and surface water resources. So in August of 2020, um, uh, Pierre and Kyla Bennett notified us and MDAR that they had sampled some pesticide formulations, in particular Anvil 10 plus 10, uh, which was used for the last uh, aerial spraying uh, event, and they detected some PFAS. Um, so they let us know that, and obviously there was quite a bit of concern about uh, the potential for contaminating surface water bodies in the environment. Um, we went out and collected our own samples and uh, fairly quickly confirmed that what they had reported was in fact correct. 
that there were some PFAS being detected uh, in this particular formulation. At that time, we also did a quick um, worst case back of the envelope uh, assessment of whether or not the amounts that were sprayed could have adversely impacted drinking water reservoirs in the areas where it was, was sprayed. And the conclusion was it wasn't really even close to presenting a, a significant risk. In fact, probably would not even be able to detect the concentrations of the PFAS that were introduced uh, from the spraying into the environment. So at that point, we had some discussions with the manufacturer who basically said, you know, we're not adding any PFAS uh, to this. EPA confirmed that this formulation wasn't uh, uh, approved for any PFAS uh, uh, ingredients. In fact, that there were no PFAS ingredients currently registered for use in pesticides. Um, so one of the uh, things that we identified as a possible source was the containers. Um, and there is a fluorination treatment that is uh, done to the containers to strengthen them so they can hold the pesticides for shipping and storage more safely. So in December 2020, US EPA, the Mead laboratory, that's the EPA pesticide laboratory, um, tested some leachate. They did some methanol rinsates and found PFAS at you know, fairly high concentrations in the methanol leachates from some of these fluorinated containers. They provided us with duplicate samples and we confirmed that as well. So it definitely seems to be some relationship, or at least for this formulation, uh, between that process and the generation um, of various PFAS, and we'll get into which ones in, in a little while here, um, in the containers that potentially could leach into whatever stored into the, into the containers. So in the winter, the manufacturer voluntarily recalled the formulations that we had in Massachusetts that were in the fluorinated containers. They have now switched to containers that do not um, use that fluorination process. And we have tested those and confirmed they do not uh, contain measurable amounts of PFAS. Um, and then we have been testing some additional pesticides to see if there are other issues. So the possible sources, of, as I've indicated, they, could have been intentionally added. It doesn't seem to be any evidence supporting that now. Um, in the past, it probably quite likely that there uh, were some PFAS used in some of the pesticide formulations historically. Uh, we haven't really been able to piece that together, but it seems uh, likely based on some historical information that might have been the case. Um, could also be incidental contamination from ingredients in the formulation. So they have active agents, they have surfactants, um, they have oils and other things, or in the process um, uh, equipment that they use to mix up the formulations and then package them. Again, there's no direct evidence of that that we've been able to dissertain, uh, but it's difficult to rule out. The manufacturer of Anvil 10 plus 10 did go back through their process and test various components of their formulation and really didn't identify uh, any sources. And then the containers for this fluoridation. Um, and then it's also possible that the use of post-manufacturer recycled plastic products, potentially recycled from fluoridated containers, could potentially be a source as well. All right, so the results for the fluorinated containers, what were detected are the compounds that are listed here, uh, typically in decreasing order. So the short chain compounds were the most uh, commonly observed ones, um, and then increasing up to the longer chain compounds. A maximum value in the methanol rinsates, almost 500,000 parts per trillion nanograms per liter for the short chain PFBA was detected in, in one sample. Um, and these were detected in both interior and exterior methanol rinsates. Uh, so the results uh, of some of the containers, just to sort of summarize, are presented here. Um, and we are occasionally getting hits of longer chain compounds um, and occasionally a hit of a sulfonated compound. Um, in, in the case of non-fluoridated containers, um, and and we were a little surprised by this. We had the manufacturers uh, basically supply us with containers using the new process that were not fluorinated. And 15 of 17 of those containers were clean, no measurable levels of any PFAS, but two of them were well above the, uh, the reporting limits uh, as presented here. And again, the pattern is very reminiscent of what we detected in the fluorinated containers when we knew they were fluorinated. All right, so we're seeing these um, in these containers, primarily the carboxylates, uh, concentrations typically inversely related to chain length, 
to interior and exterior. And again, this is with a methanol rinse aid. Um, and we have these two cases where a reportedly non-fluorinated container had hits that look very similar. I suspect that what's happening here is that there was some supply chain mix up and that there are probably some of these fluorinated containers still in the supply chain and they're getting um, accidentally or inadvertently used um, in the packaging. Um, so with time as the fluoridated containers are, are used up, this should, uh, should disappear. We can't completely rule out that there might be some other source contribution, but we really um, uh, think it's the, the containers and, and this mix up of the types of containers that are being used. So I do wanna emphasize some of the uncertainties and limitations here. So these are me methanol rinse aids. So they're not necessarily gonna directly to compare with what might leach out of the container into whatever's in the container. We're focused on pesticides, uh, but some of these fluorinated containers are likely used for other products as well. Um, variations in the rinse aid procedure um, and how long things are stored and whatnot. The surface area can also determine or change the levels of PFAS that are being pulled out of the containers. So if you look at one set of data from another from different organizations, you might well see different concentrations. And in the case of some uh, of the values, we, we had to extrapolate because they were outside on the high end of the instrument calibration curves. All right, so other formulations that we've sampled, we've looked at a whole bunch of other formulations now. Um, smaller containers were shaken and not stirred, so we get a good mix up of the material um, uh, in the formulations. We did field blanks, equipment blanks, and field duplicates were collected, and sometimes we did detect um, slight contamination of the sampling devices. We also sampled open and unopened containers, various types of uh, container sizes and shapes, and if available, multiple lots from the same manufacturer. So at the time, there was no method. Um, the EPA uh, need laboratory has since issued a method that you can access at this particular site. So Alpha Analytical used a modified EPA method 533, uh, which is an isotopic dilution method uh, with 25 analytes, including the, the five, the six that we're regulating here in Massachusetts. So summary of the results. Well, we didn't detect PFAS at detectable levels in the majority of the formulations and, and container sizes that we sampled. The ones that were, were clean are here. Um, um, again, in some cases, we, we had formulations in fluorinated containers and non-fluorinated. The non-fluorinated ones uh, attested uh, uh, with no PFAS. Uh, but we did have some that, that did have PFAS. Um, again, we have those two uh, uh, samples of the fluorinated containers, and uh, it looks like some of that carryover uh, confusion in the market uh, uh, ch supply chain uh, also got carried over here. Um, and we had some um, formulations of larvicide and uh, synthetic pyrethroid formulation that were uh, uh, contaminated with a possible branch chain PFOS. And for one of the containers, we think it probably wasn't that after lots of additional work. Okay, so the larvicide that we looked at, we sampled seven lots, lots of different container sizes. This is an important one because it's used early in the season to try to kill the mosquito larva before they hatch. Um, possible branch chain PFOS was detected in many of the samples. Uh, interestingly enough, the really big containers tested clean. Um, it's hard to explain that, but we, these are the ones that were used last year. Um, the mosquito control districts that are responsible for applic uh, applying the pesticides uh, um, uh, phased out using the other ones. The identification of the peak was uncertain. Um, so is it a PFAS or not? I'm not going to get into the technical details of the analytical work, but uh, 533, the EPA method really only looks at one, one ion, doesn't look at secondary ions. So there's some um, uncertainty regarding the identification of the peak as being a branch chain PFOS or not. We did actually run some samples with the secondary ion product. Uh, we did not see it indicating this is probably not uh, a P, uh, PFOS. Certainly it's not the six PFOS branch chain. It could be one of the other branch chains but we think likely not. The manufacturer has done some additional testing and sampling 
Um, and they've associated this particular peak with a bile acid, which is well-known confounder in PFAS analysis and can lead to false positive results if it's present. So this seems to be, I think, a pretty likely explanation for what we're seeing. Their manufacturing process um, could actually generate some of these bile acids because they're growing um, um, uh, the a larvicide uh, in big vats where they're adding different agents uh, um, to have them grow different growth media. So we're in the process of conducting some additional sampling to confirm this, but I think this is a pretty likely explanation for what we're seeing in this particular formulation. Okay, the synthetic pyrethroid is a little bit more complicated. Again, we tested lots of different lots. We have two different examples on the pie charts on the right. Uh, we're seeing several different uh, sulfonated compounds. And again, in several of the containers, we're seeing um, the uh, shorter chain um, uh, carboxylates as well, which again, I think is because of a supply chain issue and some of these were packaged in the fluorinated containers. Again, it's possible that the PFOS that we're detecting here uh, could be that bile acid. Um, we're not 100% sure about that yet, but then we have a couple of other sulfonates that are harder to explain with respect to contamination from that source. Um, we're in the process of collecting some additional samples to try to do some further analysis to see if we can figure out um, for sure what those are. All right, so there's just a range of the data that we're seeing again for the carboxylates. It's similar to what we detected uh, in the fluorinated containers, um, even though they were reported to be non-fluorinated. And that's an example of what we're seeing um, for a couple of the formulations with the carboxylates. So over, overall uh, conclusions here, um, measurable PFAS were uh, unexpectedly detected in some of these mosquito side formulations. We were not expecting really to see anything. Um, there are some analytical challenges and uncertainties for some of the data. These are complicated matrices to do extractions from to get phase separations. And there's some analytical issues. We have this beautiful putative PFAS detection, probably spurious uh, attributable to the a bile acid issue. Uh, nonetheless, because we're um, uh, concerned about these issues due to their persistence, we're uh, committed to trying to uh, further identify and reduce any PFAS that may be in these formulations. We think it's pretty clear the fluorinated containers are a source. Um, there may be some supply chain issues or possibly other sources. Um, and we're working to see how extensive these fluorinated containers um, may be used in the marketplace. Certainly they're used for products beyond pesticides. Um, and there's some indication from some website um, digging that I've done that uh, they may also be used for some consumables. So there could be a potential direct source of exposure. Um, we're in the process of sharing information with the manufacturers, states, and other stakeholders just to get this information out so people can be aware of the fluorinated container issue and where possible avoid their use. And that's it. If anybody has any quick questions, uh, do we have time for questions or are we going to hold them? Hold them to the end. Okay, great. Thank you. Great, that was fascinating. It's been an issue I know many of us have been following with great interest. Um, so let's see, I'll close out of here and we'll get slides for our next speaker. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Dora Chang, um, who is the Vice President and Global Technical Leader at Wood. She holds bachelor's and master's degrees in chemistry and has a PhD in environmental engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. She has over 20 years of consulting experience investigating and treating environmental pollutants, uh, including emerging contaminants. And Dr. Chang has 10 years of experience on PFAS site characterization, conceptual site model development, and the development and demonstration of PFAS destruction uh, processes. She is part of the Global Technical Excellence Network, I believe that's within Wood, um, and uh, they're working on accelerating the transition of technologies from research to, or from, yeah, research to market um, for a lot of these uh, kinds of issues. So she's also active in the ITRC PFAS team as a training group co-leader, um, a trainer, and as a member of the remediation subgroup. So welcome, Dr. Chang. Thank you so much. So glad to be here. 
So um, today I'm going to talk about an interesting topic, uh, focusing on how PFAS can interact with microplastics. So if you think about PFAS and microplastic, are those two classes of emerging contaminants probably most prevalent and persistent in the environment that you can imagine. So how can that those two correlate with each other and what happened? Uh, what does that really mean if a microplastic become a vehicle to carry the PFAS around into a surface water body, what the ultimate impact to the environment? So um, I think this is a very interesting topic. Just want to make a note. So far, the research on these two topics combined together is very limited. So my today's presentation is really trying to summarize the literature's and add some of my interpretation based on my 20 years of working on emerging contaminants. So I want to start with the online of today's presentation. Before we talk about microplastic, one thing we really need to learn is what is plastic? What are they not made of? What are the compositions? And how they can break down into microplastics? Then I'm going to focus in on how PFAS can be generated from plastic manufacturing and how microplastic become a vector for the PFAS. And then we'll end up with a summary as well as some recommendation on how we can mitigate and treatment um, of this issue. So I'm going to start with type of plastic. Um, I want to clarify because plastic microplastic certainly is all based on some kind of polymers. So um, when we talk about plastic, the first thing before we talk about microplastic is how biodegradable those, uh, those practices are. As you can imagine, they can impact at what rate they transform into the microplastic and, and how they transform into the microplastic. So the first things I want to share with everyone is the biodegradability of the plastics. So you probably heard about bioplastics. Yeah, so actually they are bio-based plastics. They are degradable or non-degradable, but you also have biodegradable plastics. So let's look into non-biodegradable plastics. So if the plastics are made of um, some kind of like a scotch, um, those are environmental friendly ingredient and to make um, polyacetylene, for example, PE. So those are what we call the bio-based plastic, non-biodegradable. So you also probably heard about the fuel-based non-biodegradable plastics. So regardless what is originally made of, if that is bio-based or fuel-based, they end up the polymers are same composition. They have the same properties. They are the same way. They are not biodegradable and they are not biodegradable, regardless of where they're originally coming from. They have the same chemical structures. But when you talk about biodegradable plastic, it's different. Uh, the structure is different. Definitely, if you have the right environmental condition, they can be biodegraded in the environment. However, biodegradable plastic doesn't really mean you create that plastic, you sit there, you were breaking down in days or months, right? So a lot of time biodegradable plastic can still take years and years to biodegrade. In that situation, people, some of the state avoid to use biodegradable plastic. Instead, they call that decomposable biodegrade, uh, biodegradable plastic. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the um, compostable plastic saying that way. So when you talk about bioplastic as a term in summary, they really refer to any plastic that is bio-based and biodegradable plastics. So the next thing I want to look into is actually the classes of plastic we talk about here. Um, there are some common plastic we all heard about, including PET, uh, polyacetylene terephthalate, um, high density PE, uh, polyacetylene, low density PE, P, uh, PVC, polypropylene, polystyrene, and some of the others. So you can kind of see they all have a different polymer structures made of different uh, monomers. Um, they also make different products. The another thing I want you to, to get your attention is looking to their density. Density is particularly interest, right? Because once they're breaking down into the microplastics, you look into their density, they will give you some idea of whether they are going to float or they are going to sink. Whether they were going to sink, sediment, aggregate, and, and flow down to the bottom of the water body, or it's very light and it's going to flow on the top of water body. So that can kind of trigger in terms of the transport. And then you think about if there are some chemicals, organics that attach the microplastic, you can change the field and transport accordingly as well. So the density is definitely a one property you want to look into. The next thing is talking about decompose under perfect conditions. 
So non-biodegraded plastics, they do not biodegrade. However, they do can decompose over time as everything worn out over years. And depending on different climate, different temperatures and different photolysis, you can potentially decompose the plastic and become microplastic even though they are not biodegradable. So that is the plastic. Very complicated as you can imagine. So now let's look into microplastics. So even though we all talk about microplastics, so they are on the news, on the social media, everyone talk about microplastics, just like 10 years ago, everyone started talking about PFAS. So even how you define microplastic is still not certain. Um, different countries, different regions may define microplastic in a different way. But I listed two examples right here is how California Water Board define microplastic in drinking water versus how European countries define microplastics. Um, first of all, talking about California. So California Water Board really define is more focusing on the diameter of the particles. So it defined as, I'm going to read it out because it's very important. <laughs> So first of all, we need to define that plastic is made of the solid parametric materials and that normally will have the chemical additives or other substance they have been added into the processing. And then the particles is very critical. We're talking about greater than one nanometer and less than five millimeter or 5,000 micrometers. So it's actually covering a very wide range or even cover the nano size particles, right? You start looking to like greater than one nanometer. So it's a very wide range of particles as we're talking about here. So if the polymer they are made of naturals, it's natural curry is actually excluded from this definition. So when you look at the size definition, it's really looking to the dimension or diameter of the particles. On the European countries, they included the fibers. So when you think about the fiber and put into the definition, uh, it becomes a little bit more different because it does put the lens into the fiber, into the definition. So it's a one to three ratio. And say, if you have one nanometers of particles and then the lens is probably, I would say probably once you use like three times of, meaning it's three nanometers, it becomes the it meet into the uh, definition for, for the fiber type of microplastics. So, in the European countries, the FEC is about the same. Um, they look into diameters between one nanometer and five millimeters. Or for fiber, it has a length of three nanometer to 15 nan uh, millimeter. All right, that is a definition for microplastic. So, so once the microplastic release, this is very annoying. <laughs> I have no idea. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if this is what. Oh, this is the is there, there's a phone right here. Is it this one? This is a timer. Is this someone's? Is this someone's oh, someone someone's phone? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like it's very close to me, but it came from somewhere. <laughs> oh, at least I found it. <laughs> no problem. All right. <laughs> So uh, now looking to how microplastics get into our environment. So when we define microplastics in, in addition to the size, there's also one thing we need to know in terms of the source. When we define microplastics, there are primary sources of microplastics. So what that really means when it will be manufactured, it was manufactured for the principles as the size as microplastic, like pellets, um, what we call the pre-production treatment, uh, pre-production kind of microplastic like pallets. Um, some manufacturer that manufacture pallets um, and then send to uh, the, the end user productions and then fold it into the bottles or some kind of shade of final products. And that we call them as a primary um, microplastics. And they are also secondary source, which are means they are breaking down from the final product, like a plastic bottle or something, and, and breaking down under the environment, and we call those as the secondary um, source. So regardless, regardless if they are primary or secondary, once it becomes the microplastics get into the environment, um, it can get into the wastewater treatment systems. Um, it can be trash. Um, 
like just like trash getting into the river and then and eventually leach um, the microplast into our environment. In terms of the life cycle figures on the right hand side, if you're like, oh my God, is this a PFAS talk or microplastic talk? <laughs> it's almost like identical. And you get in the air, you get in the surface water, um, you, you, um, you get to the soil, um, you know, and then they are now biodegradable for most of the common plastic we use. So the fate and trends were almost like the same figures, <laughs> like a PFAS. The only thing I think is more limited is looking to microplastic into the groundwater. So the groundwater pathway is very limited and we don't think it will get into the groundwater based on the literature review. So one of the things that really get everyone's attention is really the secondary microplastic transfer process in the water bodies. So this figure kind of emphasizes that, say you, you, you trash a, a plastic bottle into the ocean. What will happen is through the UV, the photolysis, it can breaking down fragmentation and generally the microplastic. And then you can imagine once again, go back to the density of different plastics. Some of them are going to float, some of them are going to sink. And once that process, just imagine the plastic once they're breaking down and throw into the environment, it's no longer a beautiful plastic. It will interact with organic matters. You will interact with inorganics. You will interact with bacteria. So as that transport through times, um, definitely there are stuff, a lot of different stuff are going to interact with the microplastic and transport and then being uptake by, uptake by the biota and then go into our food, food web that way. So this kind of a nice figure really illustrate how you can the fit and trace more microplastic. How, and then you start thinking about microplastic, right? It can made of the organics and have some kind of processing ad that use for manufacturing plastic. So those contaminants can come out from the microplastic. And at the same time, there are some organics and contaminants in the environment was going to stick on the microplastic. So you actually have organic, uh, have the organic contaminants going out and getting on. So that is very interesting in terms of understanding the relationship and um, how the microplastics interact with different materials in the environment. So this is kind of a summary. I grab a, a literature result just to help everyone to understand where you can find microplastics. And once again, once a mi one microplastic gets into the environment, it's not just about plastic. It's of everything beyond just microplastic. It can interact with inorganic and organics. So as you can see from the left-hand side, um, the left-hand side, the two bars are wastewater treatment influence and afferent. And based on all the literature, they are going to tell you that wastewater treatment plant without any upgrade or any optimization, they can remove microplastic very well. So you can see a wider range of a microplastic, a number of microplastics being detected. And then when you look into the groundwater, which is a thin line in the middle of it, the groundwater is almost, you will not find microplastic at all. Surprisingly, you will find the microplastic in tap water, regardless uh, if that's untreated or if it's treated, or if that is uh, bottled water. And the study also evaluate different kinds of uh, microplastics um, based on the global review, um, polyacetylene, polypropylene are most commonly detected microplastic in the environment, and then microstyrene and PVC and PET. And as a mention of the density, um, so there are higher tendency of PVC and PET to settle because of their higher density greater than one. So now it's really the the center of today's presentation is looking at the PFAS on plastics versus PFAS on the microplastics. So this is a quote uh, from a Scott um, publication in 2021. Um, Given the prevalence of PFAS and microplastic in natural waters, coupled with extremely long persistence time of both classes of pollutants. And this is very unique, right? Because PFAS and microplastic are no longer pointing to single compound. It's the classes. It just, you cannot count how many compounds that we're talking about here. It's applied to both classes of emerging contaminants. And these two groups of emerging contaminants may act synergistic, uh, synergistic, 
called Li. <laughs> oh my God. They can act synerg synergetic in terms of in the food web to cause an adverse effect in fish and wildlife as well as humans. So I want to share, uh, since Mark just talked about the PFAS from plastics. So we know PFAS can associate with plastic because PFAS can be used as a processing as um, when you manufacture some of the plastics. And also there is a process called fluorination process. That is how high density polyacetylene bottles can release and leach out PFAS. Immediately, I don't know if there is a, a little chemist in this room, because we all use HDP bottles for PFAS samples. So maybe those HDP bottles never go through fluorination process, but what it does is those containers, they do the fluorination process to protect um, the container to, um, to be water and uh, oxygen um, repellent basically to repel water and oxygen. So during that fluorination process, they actually inject the foreign gas the purpose of that is using the fluorine um, atom to replace the hydrogen on the polymer structures. So in that way, during that process, once they're breaking down over time, it can potentially release PFAS compounds that way. Um, so this, the data uh, through that fluorination process on the HDP content have been published. I think Mark mentioned that as well. And with that putting all together, uh, I'm very glad well, I would say God, that U.S. plastic pack actually include PFAS as a problematic unnecessary material list. So why is that important? As we are in this room, we heard about the circular economy, how to recycle, maximum the recycle of a plastic in our environment. But if you do have the PFAS associated with your plastics, those plastic is not recyclable because you actually recycling your contaminant in the environment over and over again. So that Plastic pack actually pointed out PFAS is listed as a problematic and necessary materials. So this is a result showing how different containers can contain carboxylates and their concentrations. As you can see on the slide, concentration level are pretty high. And once again, just like I mentioned, is using the methanol to rinse the bottle and collect the data that way. Um, there are another type of polymers that have not been very frequently discussed, but we start to heard about there are some fluoride polymer carboxylate uh, being detected in the landfill leachate. I, I do not really have a direct evidence that is associated with this side chain for a polymer based polymers, but there is a likelihood it can be the chance. So there are some kind of um, surface treatment chemicals. Um, are made of those side chain photopolymer based polymers. I'm showing the structure to the right hand side. I don't know how many chemists in this room. When I look at these chemicals, I'm like, holy crap, what kind of stuff is that? <laughs> so you can see the base structure and then the bottom, right? The base structure is right here. They connect each polymer into a polymer. So this is the, the things right here. They connect all the monomer together. And the monomer itself has the structure like this. Doesn't that look familiar with you? If you understand forward polymers, and that is uh, a fully fluorinated hydrocarbon chain release, and then you have two CH2, CH2, then you have the COO structure right there. So once you're breaking down what would turn out to be, yeah, if you think about the chemistry, the first thing you will do, you will definitely break down right here. All right, and then they will kind of generate volatile alcohols with the OH as the functional group. So once they release in the landfill leachate, what next thing they will do, they will give away those two CH2 and then become carboxylates under aerobic conditions. And so that is why people say, well, volatile carboxylate can be detected in landfill leachate. And I think it's somehow possibly related to a structure right here because it makes total sense. It's not going to follow thermal softness, it will be full of thermal capacity because of the polymer structure right here. <laughs> All right, so um, as you can see on this slide where they have been used, they have been used by the textile fabrics, carpets, paper industry, packaging industry, and all that. The potential precursors include volatile alcohols. Those are volatiles, very unstable. When you talk about uh, volatile PFAS, they will quickly convert it into the carboxylate if the environment is right. 
So meaning if you do have a landfill leachate, leaving the landfill, getting to the groundwater, exposed to the oxygen, it will convert it into carboxylates, okay? Um, so, so that is one type of polymers. We talk about the PFAS coming out from the plastics. And now we're talking about how PFAS will be on the microplastics. So um, there are a few studies today um, that look into what kind of a chemicals they will interact with microplastics. So chemical additive or plastic herbicides are the compounds that can come out from the plastics because they're being used as a processing add or some kind of a chemical to make the plastic. Those compounds can include uh, by um, bisphenols A, my gosh, I did not really present for a long time. My tongues are not kind of <laughs> for solids. <laughs> and then um, those kind of uh, practicizers, you can imagine Then you also have a POPs. And um, mainly this is study from Scott, uh, including PAHs, PCB, and PFAS. Um, if you read, really read the publications, the concentration of a PFAS, uh, PAHs and PCB concentrated on, P, on, on the microplast is more significant compared to P, PFAS concentrate on the microplastic, but definitely is a very evident that PFAS does interact with microplastics. And then there's another thing is a passaging, so they can interact with microplastics as well. And NJIT recently have a publications on this interact. Um, interactions between those two things and, and find that certain bacteria elevated that antibody resistance by up to 30 times when living on microplastic biofilms. So it's a very incredible finding. <laughs> um, and then this is a one case study I want to share with everyone is Muskegon Lake in Michigan. So they tested three different types of microplastics meaning they purchase the standard microplastics and then bait it into the sampling locations for a period of time. So um, the star on the map is showing where um, they deploy uh, microbeads into the surface water body. There are four different locations. One is surface channel sampling location, bottom channel sampling locations, surface lake sampling location, and bottom lake sampling locations. So they made single beads, they deploy, uh, collect the sample in one month, collect sample from three months. Those are considered a short duration. Normally in average, based on publications, the microplastic based on the model, microplastic will be in our environment about 16 years. So three months of deployment compared to 16, month, 16 years is very short, almost like negligible duration for microplastic interact with PFAS. But we still have some kind of a findings. And another thing is in terms of a particle size. And they are actually uh, use a very relatively large particle size on the large size end. Um, they're talking about two to four millimeters, not nano size. Now micro size is at a millimeter. So comparing to the small particle size, they have a higher surface area. This is the other end. Those are considered the large particle size. And they also, through this study, they identify different factors. They can uh, interfere or uh, interpret the PFAS absorption of microplastics. Those can include size and surface area of microplastic. So those are depending on the size and looking into what, what's the content of water quality associated with organic matters, biofilms, and the incubation time is also very critical and also types of plastics. And um, they find um, seven different kinds of PFAS, uh, including C6, C7, C8, C9 carboxylates, um, and also C10, and C4, and C8 sulfonates. And the ones with stars are the ones in dominant. So they also did some kind of a statistical study and see how the correlation will be as such as a PFAS concentration associated with where the collect samples were collected uh, related to the particle size, um, related to some other factors. So it's a great uh, study to look into. So there are also, so far, what we know, the, the SCOTS publication is really probably um, the early study that we are aware of, they have the control, they actually compare the results between laboratory and the field de deployment. And certainly the laboratory 
but you just put the P, uh, microplast into the water with PFAS, the interaction is very minimal, right? Comparing to the field deployment, why is that? Just like I say, when you have a microplast releasing to the environment, everything changed. There is organics matter, there are bacteria, they all are absorbed on the microplastic. So the microplastic does provide primary absorption, also secondary absorption through the biofilm. So um, that is a very important uh, mechanism that identify. You can also see and confer um, on this slide as well in terms of how the PFAS can interact with microplastic and there are still a potential environmental factors. They can determine the interactions. Oh, by the way, I think this is a very nice figure, right? To the bottom. So this is how the virgin uh, polyester for the study. And once they just deploy for three months, this is how it looks like. Right, so that gives you a general sense and why the study is so important because surface area can be changed because of the contamination of microplastics. So as we talk about PFAS and microplastic, if you do want to control the risk and, and, and try to mitigate the, uh, the, the interaction is really to control the microplastics. So I want to share with everyone in terms of the ways we look into this issue. Um, I break into three different categories and they can, we can do this concurrently or sequentially or whatever. And normally when I look into emerging contaminants, I like to break into three major categories. The upstream who manufacture it and the midstream who receive those. They can be the end users. It can be the landfill wastewater treatment plants and to the downstream who actually is the receptor of the issues. So the downstream is typically what we want to monitor first because that is direct exposure to the issues, right? We can focus on drinking water and food and coastal area surface water. And for the upstream, if there's a manufacturing facility in the manufacturing microplastic, you can go look into the stormwater, wastewater, air emission, trying to reduce that way. And then the regulatory framework is very important. There are several different uh, regulation and policy out there trying to um, reduce the use of single use of plastics and um, control the pre-production plastics as well as um, some other plastic products and how we handle the plastic waste, things like that. So um, only a few slides left. <laughs> Oh, I still have time. Um, is <laughs> I'm kind of wrapping up very quickly. So this is a wastewater treatment plant. Like I say, normally the primary, secondary, tertiary, if you, you have the filtration system, you can remove microplastic very efficiently. Normally we talk about greater than 90%. And this is a nice summary table. I go through all the literature review and find the technology. They say they have promising in terms of remo removing microplastic and percentage of micro, uh, removal, the size of particle being removed and um, how they measure this removal. And microplastic measurement is still a big science and big knowledge gap that we need to fill in. So when you read the publications in terms of microplastics, you do need to pay attention how they quantify the microplastics. Sometimes it's just through the major, sometimes very, very simple microscopy. So it, it does have some quality issue when we report the removal efficiencies. So this is a quick summary. Um, I kind of walk you through, uh, understand the PFAS and microplastic both are prevalent and persistent in the environment. And we understand now in terms of the PFAS coming out from the plastic and the PFAS on the microplastics. And we do have a lot of knowledge gap that we need to fill in, in terms of assessment perception and how we communicate the issues. And um, most of the time when we talk about microplastic, we talk about the water and sediment, those coastal area. Um, the understanding of PFAS migration pathways through the interaction with microplastics is still at the infant stage right now, very limited, uh, more research will be needed. And just like PFAS, we don't know how much we don't know at this point. So I want to finish up my presentation. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang. All right. Um, so our next speaker is going to be uh, Jen Jackson, who is joining us remotely. So if you just give me a moment, I'll uh, I'll close out of this. Oh, let me. 
Hi, Jen. <laughs> um, I think you can go ahead and uh, share your screen. I'll pause the share from this side. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce you. So um, Jen Jackson manages the Toxics Reduction and Healthy Ecosystems Program at the San Francisco Department of the Environment. And she and her team lead programs and implement policies that reduce the use of toxic chemicals to improve environmental and human health. These initiatives include, and this is quite an impressive list, regulations banning city purchases of carpet furniture and food surface wear, service wares containing fluoridated chemicals, an award-winning integrated pest management system uh, or program, and programs for green business, urban biodiversity, and residential household hazardous waste. So they're really covering a lot of different ground. Um, previously, she worked in wastewater and stormwater, uh, pollution prevention for public agencies, and uh, she started off her career in the nonprofit sector at Sierra Club and Save the Bay. Uh, she holds a master's degree in geography, resource management, and environmental planning, and uh, her thesis focused on study sources of endocrine disrupting chemicals in wastewater. So, uh, Jen, go ahead, and uh, are you able? To, uh, let me see. Our I our sharing is paused. I think. Can you share yours? I am sharing, but oh, I okay. Oh, you know what? I just got to get out of our uh, our full screen. I'm gonna go. share again. Just yeah. Oops. I'm gonna stop ours. There we go. Okay. Wonderful. Can you see my presentation? What does it look like right now? We see your presentation. It looks good. It's not speaker view or anything, and we can see okay. you. Um, all right, great. So, all right, go Hi, ahead. everybody. <laughs> I wish I could see all of you. Um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, when Terry asked me to, to join you all, she asked if I would talk about PFAS and plastics, and I said, well, there are a few of the products that we were working on that are plastic-based, but um, she's like, that's fine. Just talk about all the products you've been working on. So. That is what I'm going to do. But just to back up, um, I think all of you know this, probably most of you work for states and local governments, but cities and sometimes states are often stuck with problem products. And those end up in our landfills, in the sanitary sewer, as we just heard, in our stormwater systems as well, and then also in people. And PFAS specifically, as I think probably most of you all know, are in a lot of products and it's really, really challenging. You think about all of these products, plus many, many, many more, and it's kind of like, what do we focus on? And in San Francisco, particularly as a city, what can we do? And we do have a number of different tools. We can use uh, policy tools, like we can have some bans and legislation, et cetera. But um, with PFAS, I would say that the, the primary tool we have been using is harnessing the power of the purse, so our purchasing program. And we have two ordinances that we point to as justification for our being able to do that. And the first is our buy green ordinance. And uh, it's because we buy a lot of stuff. We passed an ordinance a long time ago that enables our department to create regulations uh, on different products that the city purchases, mostly commodity-based products. So things that you might buy on Staples or Granger, big, uh, big kind of purchases of lots of little things. And then we also have a green building ordinance that sets forth different product categories. It, it sets forth lots of things, like we have to have lead gold pro, uh, buildings, but lead doesn't address toxics and lots of products. Unfortunately, a lot of the requirements and lead or optional credits. So we added our own requirements on our own projects that would address toxics. And so initially, you know, there's this world of problem products that contain PFAS. And we're like, well, what do we work on first? And really I would say that the a lot of our initial work was very much opportunistic. It was like, well, what's coming up in our contracts? What's coming, what's really literally knocking on our door? And the first project was our carpet story. And this literally was a, a, a knock on our door. A carpet manufacturer had been wanting to sell carpet at Moscone Center, which is a huge conference center in San Francisco. Um, and they were being told that they couldn't sell their carpet because it was a PVC-based carpet. So they said, hey, would you relook at your 
requirements on PVC. We have a, have a longstanding ban on, on buying things made from PVC. And um, would you open that up because we have really great carpet, it's recyclable, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're like, well, okay, let's look at this because we'd love to get PFAS out of carpet and maybe there are other things too. And we did not know what we did not know. <laughs> it's a huge world in carpet. So the first thing we did was we surveyed eight manufacturers um, of carpet. There actually are not that many major manufacturers of carpet in the United States. And most carpet is bought in the US by US manufacturers or from US manufacturers because it's heavy. So it's not a product that gets shipped internationally very much. Um, smaller rugs, et cetera, yes, but not big carpet. Um, so we did this survey and we asked all kinds of things about toxics, about which eco labels their products had, whether they had recycled contents. So we we're looking at a lot of different parameters because our buy green ordinance is not just about toxics, it's about water use, energy efficiency, carbon footprint, et cetera. So we asked a lot of questions of lots of manufacturers, including the one that originally had approached us. And we ended up funneling all this survey information into what we think could be our requirements for purchases. And the first requirement was a cradle to cradle silver certification. And at that time, we started this work in 2016. At that time, cradle to cradle did not have a ban or a restriction on PFAS. That has since changed, which is great news. But at the time, the, the version of cradle to cradle did not ban PFAS. And so we were like, well, cradle to cradle is a good place to start because they talk about all these different nice sustainability parameters, but we need a plus. We need to add to that. So we added our plus, which was, first of all, no PFAS. Um, we, needed to buy certain kinds of carpet that were in tile shape because that's much more recyclable and all these other things that we wanted. And, um, and then we went to those manufacturers again and said, okay, now we really need to see rubber hits the road now, which products can meet this? And so we, we looked at that and then we shared with our stakeholders with carpet purchasers across the city like Moscone Center Airport, all the big purchasers. Of carpet and we said these would be your your uh your carpets that you could buy is that enough for you you know from an aesthetics perspective and we also told them the why this is why we're trying to do this you know we don't want to be contributing to PFAS in the world and microplastic mic microfibers every time you wash that carpet clean that carpet it's going somewhere so they got on board and they agreed and at the time we only had two manufacturers that could meet all of those requirements. Um, in 2018, we passed our regulations. So these were the things, we, actually all of the things on that other slide actually were part of those requirements. So two were able to meet the standard and now we have four. So if any one of you is at all engaged in purchasing or can tell your purchasers in your state, we did a ton of work to do this and we love to share it. Um, so we, have this website, sfapproved.org, that is really meant for our purchasers, but it's publicly available. Anybody can go there and check it out. And these are the manufacturers now that can meet our specs. And if you click on any one of those links for at the, the green arrow, you'll get all the products that meet those specs. And I'll tell you, this is a lot to keep up with. <laughs> so I have one team member, Jesse and Shui, who surveys all of the manufacturers every year or so, and we update this list. Um, we haven't done it in a little while, actually I'm seeing this now, and um, it, it's a really tough thing to keep up, but we're in the process of updating and it should be done probably in the next couple weeks. So another opportunity that came our way was working on food service fair. So it happened actually more or less around the same time, 2016, 2017. We found out that we had a food service fair contract, like for all the supplies for our two hospitals that have cafeterias. And so we thought, well, you know, we're really concerned. We have this ordinance, a different ordinance that requires all compostable food service fair to go into compost. And we we're concerned that, you know, we've been hearing rumors and there we heard a rumor that there was a study coming out very soon that there that was going to show that a lot of those very nice earthy looking compostable containers actually had PFAS in them. 
to convey that oil, water, or barrier so your lunch doesn't completely saturate that container. So all that stuff is supposed to go into compost in San Francisco. We require all food soiled paper to go to compost and we didn't want to contaminate our compost. And so we did some product testing from of products that we were actually buying and some of them were good, didn't have any PFAS. So we did a total organic fluorine, a, a, sorry, it was a total fluorine test um, out of University of Notre Dame. It's just a proxy. It's not it's not an expensive test. Um, it's just a, showing yes or no that it has fluorine. And so, you know, there are some reasons why plates and things might have fluorine that is not PFAS. So for example, if they use talc or have some other um, materials that are inorganic fluorine, that would show up as well. But for the most part, if we're seeing PFAS, uh, fluorine hit in products like these, it's most likely going to be because of PFAS being added. So anyway, we had several products, many products that showed up as fine, good, good to go, don't have any PFAS, and other ones that were problems. And so we were able to update our specifications and our contract for saying we don't want to have any PFAS. Um, and, and so we, we did end up doing a food service for a contract that says no PFAS. But the supply chain has been really changing over the last many years, but especially during COVID. And it's become more and more difficult to stick with those original products that we were buying before. And so um, while we were doing that product testing, we had noticed that some of our compostables were certified as compostable by this organization, Biodegradable Products Institute. And we became really concerned that, you know, PFAS aren't compostables. They shouldn't be in these products. So we approached these folks and said, hey, we have a you know longstanding relationship actually with the executive director and said, hey, you know, your standard is not sufficient. You need to actually look into this problem. And we encourage you to put a ban or restriction on PFAS. And so they did, and um, it took them about a year, which is you know really, really speedy in the world of certifications. They did that because they knew that compost was a very, very important stakeholder in their certification. So com composters decided to no longer accept compostable food service where all of a sudden their, their reason for being doesn't really exist. You know, everybody's pulling that stuff out. So um, they updated their standard. And so while there aren't a ton of products yet on BPI's registry, people can go to BPI and now everything that's on there is PFAS free and they have to, the manufacturers have to show testing that there is less than 100 parts per million of total fluorine. So another opportunity came our way um, and that was with firefighting foam. So definitely not a plastic in this case, but um, we had been hearing about the Department of Defense sites across the country that were big sources of PFAS contamination to drinking water. And we started to scratch our heads and wonder, well, you know, what are we using in San Francisco? And um, we contacted our fire department and found out that in fact our trucks, these trucks do not use PFAS containing foam, or at least that is not uh, a key ingredient. It may be a contaminant because a lot of manufacturers um, use the same machinery to, to manufacture different kinds of foams, but the kind of foam they were using was not meant to be fluorinated. And, um, but the fireboats that we have that patrol San Francisco Bay around our dockyards, et cetera, and put out fires, those did have um, that, that kind of foam. And so we uh, started to call up manufacturers, there we go, manufacturers, and ask them about, you know, what kind of ingredients do you have in your products? We really don't want PFAS. Um, a lot of them at the time when we started making these calls about 2017, didn't know what the heck we were talking about. Um, but some did and, and some said, yeah, we, you know, that we are totally PFAS free. And we said, well, can you send us your ingredient list or can you send us test results? And that's when we started getting into to problems. They didn't want to give us any information about their secret sauce. Um, definitely confidential business information in their book. And um, so for us, you know, they were offering to give us this information under a non-disclosure agreement, but as a public agency with an incredibly strong public records sunshine ordinance, 
we uh, were advised by our city attorney that we could not do that. We could not get their ingredients list. And so we we're like, well, it's one thing to make a claim that your product is PFAS free, but it's a whole other thing to actually be PFAS free. We've been seeing this over and over with other product categories where people make claims that are not really true um, for whatever reason, sometimes it's unintentional. And so we were really struggling on this one. Like, how are we going to get this information? And, you know, could you send us a piece of paper with the ingredients and we'll send you that piece of paper back? And in the end, what really saved the day is uh, green screen certified. So many of you may be familiar with this certification organization um, and clean production action, which is actually right there in Massachusetts, which is the, the home for green screen certified. Um, they, uh, undertook uh, an effort to create a new certification program for firefighting foam. And uh, initially, they were able to attract a couple large manufacturers, uh, Angus and National Foam were two of them, I believe. And ultimately, they were able to get a lot of different manufacturers to go through their certification. So this is the list now that is available. First, at first, there were just a couple. Um, we were part of the review of the standard and um, definitely all of those manufacturers that I had initially reached out to, uh, we encouraged them to become certified. Some of them are still in the process. So I'm, I'm expecting that there will probably be some more uh, phones coming onto this list. And there are all different kinds of phones. There's uh, class A, class B. If you're in the world of foam, you'll know what these mean, but class A, class B. And, wedding agents are getting certified. And so now our fire um, department is able just to look at this list, talk to their distributors and say, can you get any of these off of this list? So next thing we did, and I'm, I'm wrapping up here, but the next thing we did is we did a survey of our department. So we got a little more strategic, not just opportunistic and asked, okay, now we've done some of these things with these departments, what is of interest to you? And so um, the next thing was furniture. And furniture is really tough because there's a piece of furniture that underlies the fabric. And as you heard in the last presentation, a lot of fabrics are treated with PFAS to confer stain resistance. And so we um, were very lucky though, because there are a lot of people interested in this space, especially healthcare institutions. And so, um, they were working on this, we were working on this, and all of a sudden there were a lot of different players in this field. And so Center for Environmental Health had been working on this for quite a while with some of their, their clients. Um, green screen got into the fray level, which is the business and institutional furniture manufacturers. They also got involved in Green Health Approved, which is um, the Healthcare Without Harm program for certifying products also is available. So this is again our SF approved website. And um, this is what we point our own purchasers to so they can go and find products here that are available to them to buy. So these are some of our requirements. We actually have many other ones like no, uh, no I guess the certified wood, et cetera. And then another product category that our, our survey revealed was that, hey, you've done carpet, but we need you to talk about flooring too. Like, we don't know what we're buying out there. Is it bad? You know, we want to buy LVT. Everybody seems to want to buy LVT, but you're telling us we can't. So what can we buy? And so we have been working on that. And again, luckily there are some other folks who are very interested in this, especially the healthcare sector. And so we came out with requirements where um, we we're pointing to the healthcare without harm list. Um, and what this later then surfaced for us was a current project we're working on, which is um, floor finishes. So people are putting down these beautiful floors um, that are all you know, nice and don't have toxic chemicals or not quite as many. But then um, SFO has been San Francisco International Airport. They're a discharger to San Francisco Bay, and they have been doing a lot of testing of their discharges. And from the terminal, they were getting hits of PFAS. And the terminal is not associated with tarmac or PFAS containing firefighting foam. So like, where could this be coming from? And we believe that one of the sources may be the floor finishes. And in fact, the manufacturer that was providing SFO, the floor finishing product, um, told us that 
there aren't any products out there that don't take, contain PFAS. We don't think that is true. Um, we actually have found a number of products that have PFAS free claims if there were. Working with SFO and a lab to, we've sampled uh, 10 floor finishes that, that claim to be PFAS free so that um, ultimately, hopefully, many of them are actually indeed PFAS free and then SFO is gonna start using them and testing them on their, their flooring. And then one other current project that's just in its nascency is uh, cocks and sealants. And so another product category that we think may have PFAS, it certainly has some other contaminants of concern or even ingredients of concern like antimicrobials. Um, and we're just beginning a process with that. Okay, so with that, I will you know, allow y'all to ask questions and thank you. Um, I'm going to ask if our speakers could come over here to the lectern and then I'll uh, run out with the mic if there are people with questions. Um, but uh, while people are thinking about that, we did have a couple questions on HUVA that I can start us off with. Um, so the first one is for uh, Dr. Chang, actually. And um, the question was, when PFAS from processing aids used in manufacturing plastics enter the environment, are they bioavailable? Well, um, once it become the most famous case is actually PFOA used as a processing ad uh, for Teflon products, right? So in terms of whether they are bioavailable, just think about if that's PFOA, is it bioavailable? So uh, whether it's bioaccumulative, you can think about that way. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and there's one other question. Is this, is this on, Jen, can you hear me on this microphone? Okay. Um, are there specific classes of microplastics that show a higher absorption tendency to PFAS, e.g. polyethylene or polypropylene versus PVC or polystyrene? Um, actually, right now, based on the study, um, they try to find a correlation using um, ANOVA kind of statistical analysis. Um, they couldn't really find the direct correlation between the microplastic and, and PFAS. So also you can think about whether it's actually a laboratory study, it's just purely looking to PFAS with microplastic, or you're talking about the environment. Once you get into the environment, it's really depending on your biological activities, what kind of organic matters in the environment. So the surface area play important role because the smaller particles and definitely provide higher surface area for bioaccumulation and biofilm generation, but instead of the types, I mean, uh, polyethylene, but polyethylene, whatever, like I say, if they're related, how they move around in the environment, they can probably tell you in terms of where they potentially go, whether they will sink, they will float. And um, I think those are multiple different factors is in addition, just looking to PFAS and plastic types. Have you ever seen instances where PFAS- oh, could, could you my way for so the, the online folks can hear? Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, have you ever seen instances where PFAS has leached out of uh, plastic piping in houses and caused uh, respiratory problems? Uh, we have not, and we, we haven't really looked at that particularly closely. Um, certainly the um, plumber's tape um, has the potential to do that for sealing plumbing um, fixtures, but for the actual piping itself, we haven't looked, but I'd be surprised if, if it did. I have the microphone now, so I'm going to ask a question. Um, <laughs> this question is for Jen, and thank you for the presentation. That was really excellent. Vermont has actually got some advanced going, so I think I'll send the legislators when they ask me about stuff to your website. Um, but my question is that we've actually seen contamination at schools in their drinking water systems, and it doesn't appear to be linked to the septic systems. Um, and our, we suspect it could be from products added to the floors. So would floor finishes include waxes and things like that or that are reapplied over and over again, you know, at night when they're, when they're polishing those floors? 
Yes, that's my understanding is that um, it could be stripped off. So it could be in the stripping water, but it also could be in the actual product that is being applied. And then when you strip it off, you're discharging it. So in fact, um, I think it was one of the schools in your area in, in uh, somewhere in the Northeast that was a tip off to us that this could be the reason why SFO is having its problems. Um, but thank you for <laughs> doing your investigations and letting us know about that. Um, and as soon as we have our data on these PFAS free options, I'm happy to share what products those are that we've tested. Yeah, and, and I think some car waxes and certainly there are ski waxes. That's um, I have a question for Mark. Uh, so you mentioned before that you're originally using chlorinated containers for the mosquito side for the surface of the plastic containers. So what containers do you use now um, as an alternative that's chlorinated free? Yeah, so the manufacturers have worked with EPA to come up with alternatives that meet the EPA safety guidelines for permeability and rigidity for those types of containers. And they've come up with some alternatives that seem to work. I couldn't tell you exactly what the formulations are, but they do appear not to be leaching um, uh, any of the PFAS compounds. There was a study recently uh, used of microplastics from a fluoridation Um, yeah, I certainly see that news. I'm not a toxicologist. If there's a toxicology in this room, know how to answer that question, that would be great. Is Usha, you familiar with? I didn't hear the question. So the, the report news about microplastics in our blood. There's been a correlation between microplastics in our blood and PFAS. I don't think there's any question. Okay. I don't think there's any quantitative studies yet in terms of correlated between, and they wouldn't necessarily have the same target audience because we tend to see PFAS associated with proteins in the blood, and then um, typically also in the kidneys and the liver. And microplastics, depending on the size of the particle, they can sometimes actually penetrate cell membranes or sometimes they just kind of sit there like in the stomach compartment of animals when they get kidney cancer. So there's a lot more work to be done, I would say, in terms of trying to directly relate the two. It's possible that the liver might be one common target organ for if the particle size is small enough. Thank you, Usha. In this more clinical presentation, I think I saw that formulations don't cross that they historically would have been. I just wanted you to expand on that or confirm. Yeah, sure. Um it's hard to tell exactly which formulations might have contained PFAS, but in the past, since they're very good surfactant molecules and you do really want surfactants in many of these formulations, it's thought to be likely that they were intentionally added to some of the older formulations, but we don't really know which ones. Not, not, not that I'm aware of, and it probably would be pretty hard to track down at this point.
If that was a question for me, I'm having a hard time hearing audience questions. If someone could repeat it, that'd be great. Yeah, the question was about artificial turf, if there are any outdoor carpets that might meet the PFAS free definition. Is that ah, we don't know that. Um, I do know that most of the artificial turf, the, the top part of it is manufactured by the very same companies that make carpet, um, usually on contract. And so, uh, and the extrusion process is uh, that they typically, from what I understand, use PFAS as part of the extrusion. So um, we have not found uh, a company that is PFAS free. Um, there may be some information through DTSC, Department of Toxic Substances Control. They've been doing some research on this and um, Mona Balan would be the person to ask. audience questions? Well, I'd like to thank our presenters again. We could all give them one more hand. Um, before we break, um, I'd just like to remind everybody, um, for anyone who's seeking uh, LSP or TUR planner credit, make sure that you're stopping by the registration to, uh, to mark yourself off as in attendance. Um, but thank you all so much for joining and uh, we'll give you a little bit of a break and, and see you in a little while. <laughs>